We have already covered the first one, which is mental placement. The second one is continuous placement. So placement of the mind, where do you place your mind to? And uh, third is patch placement. A patch placement is the correcting placement, close placement. And then we also have finished taming. So from mental placement to continuous placement, to patch placement, to close placement, to taming, they all involved with the forefront five senses, the sensory organs. With the eyes, the ear, the nose, the tongue, and the body. In other words, when you're meditating, all these four front senses, the five senses, they are interacting out to your environments. Your ears listen, your eyes see, so usually we say when you're meditating you should really close your eyes, lightly close your eyes, but you still can see, there's still light coming through it. So all your five sens senses, sensory organs, still interact with the outer environments. For people who have been meditating for quite a while, they were able to control their senses. In other words, their senses may not be going wild because they can control them already. And now, after this taming, they come to the next one, which is pacification. Pacification is taming not just the five senses, but the mano consciousness. You have to know the eight consciousnesses. When the eye interacts with matter, matter being what can be visible by the eyes, there are molecules, there are protons and electrons and neutrons that may not be visible to eyes. But in here, in this case, we're talking about form that are visible to the eyes, including all colors, square, round, column, you name it, everything you can see. So when the eye corresponds to that, the matter, the eye consciousness is created. The problem is not with, with the form. Your mental afflictions arises not because of your environment, it's not because of the form. Form itself is senseless. When I see a, a, a lantern, the lantern has no emotions. My eyes have no emotions because they're matter, sensory organs. What has emotion in it? It's what is created has emotion. The consciousness. So in other words, don't blame the lantern. If you see a guy who is handsome, it arouses the sensuous in you, the sensuality in you, don't blame that guy. It's not that guy. It's not that pretty lady. When you go into a shop, you see something that you're greedy about, you see a diamond ring, and you want to steal it, you want to shoplift it. Don't blame the diamond ring. <laughs> and don't blame your eyes. What do you have to blame? It's the consciousness, the visual consciousness, that attach. So you have to know where the problem is. When your ears listen to sound, the auditory consciousness is created. Because of the auditory consciousness, it cre is created, mental affliction arises. What are these mental afflictions? I'll come to that. We have to, we have to analyze it bit by bit. So, when the ear interacts with sound, don't blame the sound. So in other words, if Lee says, venerable, you're unreasonable, you're crazy, you're not right, you are, you are perverted, if that sound is produced and I hear it, that sound should not be blamey, blame, blameworthy, because that sound has no emotion. But usually we're attached to that sound. It's not the sound, it's not the words of criticism. 
is the consciousness that's created, the auditory consciousness that's created that instigate my emotion. So I don't blame the sound. So when Sonny is attached to the computer game, don't throw his computer into the, into the fire. Nothing to do. The mistake is not with the computer itself. It's Sonny's habit. People like to blame on things. They smash things. They, they, you know, when they're angry, they smash things. But those things, they're not blameworthy. So you've done the wrong thing. If you want to smash, smash your consciousness. Can you smash your consciousness? How can consciousness be smashed? But they can be controlled. But you've done the wrong thing. You don't control your consciousness. You destroy the things. Or you destroy yourself. Or you destroy Sunny. You should educate Sunny. You should tell Sunny to control himself. What, what happened with depression? What happened with manic depressive thinking? Nothing to do with environments. It's the consciousness that we have to deal with. So, ears correspond to sound. Nose interact with smell. The odor consciousness is created. Tongue, tongue corresponds to taste. The taste consciousness is created. Body corresponds to touch, tactile object. And the touch consciousness is created. Now, these five are the crude consciousnesses. And if you come to the taming, uh, the first one is mental placement. Remember, the first one is mental placement. Second is continuous. Third is patch placement. Fourth is close placement. The fifth is taming placements. When you come to taming placements, you are able to control your forefront five sense organs already. You must be at that point that you can control this consciousness already. Talking about control, in other words, when a thought about matter is created, you will say, no, I'm not going to be led away by that. When I see a, 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 a handsome guy, when I see a beautiful girl, I won't be led away by the sensuality thinking because I'm able to control my consciousness. When I listen to a piece of music, I, I won't be so attached that I'm carried away. Or when I listen to a criticism, an unreasonable criticism, I won't get mad because I won't be carried away. But I can put all these things under control. So you're up to taming already. Now, the next, which is the sixth stage of training yourself in Samatha, is pacification. What is pacification? Pacification deals not just with the five, four, run, four, four uh, I mean the front end consciousnesses, is deal with the mono consciousness, which is the sixth consciousness. We call it the mono consciousness. Or in the Sanskrit language, it's the mono vajnana. Now the sixth consciousness is extremely powerful. The sixth consciousness is the mind that corresponds to all thoughts. That is the, the manager. The manager of the forefront five consciousnesses. In other words, if we're thinking about a shop, all those senses are in the forefront sales manager and this forefront salesman and this sales manager is at the back controlling all these. And these, and this manager, the sixth consciousness in your mind, with being the manager, is extremely active, extremely powerful. He has accessibility to all files, to all information, information of the past, information of the present, and he can also project into the future. That's you, that's me, that's in our consciousness. That's the mono consciousness. You see how powerful? Because the five consciousnesses, the salesman, 
They cannot reflect to the past. Only the manager can. So what happened? When, when the consciousness is created, the manager reflects to the past. The problem comes when you reflect to the past because you have an abusive past. You have an unhappy past. You have a past that you don't want to think about. But that past is always haunting you, attacking you, creating troubles for you. That's how depression comes. When you have an abusive childhood, for example, that shadow always cast on your consciousness. You can't get away with it. And this sixth consciousness is reflecting to the past, always bringing out all this past energy and contemplate on it. And this past is always mistaken in a lot of cases. The past will involve many, many mental functions. When the sixth consciousness is interacting with all these thoughts, that is 51 accomplices that work with it. In other words, he has 51 files in the cabinets that he's going to check into. What are these 51 files? You need to know them. If you don't even know your mind, how do you understand yourself? If you don't even know your mind, how do you enlighten yourself? The Buddha is all fully enlightened because he knows exactly what happened in his own mind and he's the master of his own mind. We are not. We are the slaves of our own mind. That's why we're committing errors. The one of these 51, 51 files that the manager is always checking into. Let's deal with them. I'm, I'm going to talk more and more in detail. As I said, Buddhism is so profound and so resourceful that you can spend years into it. But if you can master the main concept, it's within your grasp. So let's talk about the 51 consciousnesses. I mean, the 51 mental, mental functions. In the 51 mental functions, I really should be, um, in the future, maybe I should really give you all these notes that you can remember. Um, there are five general mental functions. I'm not going to talk about today, the five general functions. In other words, when the consciousness is created, there are five mental functions that is created at the same time. One of these, for example, is attention. In other words, when, the, when all the salesmen and the manager is working, if they are working with attention, they can only function if they work with attention. If they don't, if they don't work with attention, then it doesn't, they don't function well. When the customer comes in, the salesman don't care, and the, and the general manager is taking this coffee, so as if this customer is dead. I mean, it's no customer. So when the customer comes in, all the salesmen go up and say, what can I do for you? And all those, then you start the deal. So we, we talk about the five general mental functions. And we will talk about that later. And there's also a five special mental functions. And there's 11 virtuous mental functions or good mental functions. There's 26 non-virtuous mental functions, which are evil mental functions. And there are four indeterminate mental functions. Indeterminate meaning sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's both good and bad. So four indeterminate ones. So we're only talking about, let's take two classifications. Let's take two categories out and talk about it today, if we can. Remember, when your consciousness is created, there's 51 mental functions that are accomplishes, that are accompanying that 
your consciousness to help you to perform your volition, to perform your action, to perform your speech, to perform your thinking. And all of it, 11 of it is virtuous, and 26 of them are non-virtuous. Now what does that tell us? In other words, there are 26 bad mental functions that are accomplices to you, helping you to do bad deeds. And there are only 11 of them helping you to do good deeds. Let's understand the problems first. It's easy to understand our friends, because our friends are always good to us. The 11 virtuous mental functions are always helping us to achieve good things, to do good things. But there are 26 that are actually our enemies, but we treat them as friends. That's been our problems that pull us down. That makes us mentally sick. I'm not a psychologist, I'm only a monk. But I'm telling you, the Buddhist teaching is very deep, very profound. It analyzes into every detail that most of it I don't find even in some psychology books I read. But you really have to understand more about it in order to find out. Because how can you meditate if you don't understand all these things? Some people always, after meditating here for maybe half a year, they always say, okay, concentrating on the nose, yes, breathe in and breathe out, and after five months they say, where do I go from here? All the time I'm meditating on my, on my nose tip, that's samatha. How about vipassana? What's the difference between samatha and vipassana? Where do I go here? I usually keep silent. I don't say anything. Because in my mind I know you haven't even done your homework. You've come home, but you haven't finished your homework. Let's just finish your homework first. That's a lot more to do. And most people, I'm, you know, I'm sidetracking right now. I'm talking about samatha and vipassana. Most people ask, what's the difference between samatha and vipassana? Samatha being concentration, meditation, and vipassana being insightful meditation. Some people say, what's the difference between them? Now, every time when I come here, you say, concentrate on your nose tip, breathe in and breathe out, and, and, and that is concentration only. How about vipassana? Are they different? Are they the same? The Buddha said, they are the same. At the same time, they are different. So why do you say they are the same? And why do you say they are the different? They are the same because it is still within the framework of your mentality. It's within the mind. It does not matter samatha or vipassana. It is still within the framework of the mind. It's the same. It's from the same mind, right? It's your mind, my, our mind. How can you say they're different? Because they are from the same mental framework. They're from the same mind. But they are different at the same time. How come they're different? Because samatha is without discrimination, just concentration. In other words, I'm practicing my anapanasati, breath in and breath out. That's my object of concentration, nothing else. I'm not analyzing my object. I'm not investigating my object. I'm, doing not, I'm not doing any insightful thinking about my object. I'm just creating this object of attention and I concentrate onto it. How does that help me? That helps me to concentrate first. In other words, the Buddha said, that helps you to come home. To come home first, to do your homework. Because if you don't come home, how can you do your homework? You come home first because our minds have been wandering all over the place for many, many generations, for many, many years, for many, many life cycles. We have been going out, we have been at being led away, we are attaching to outside environments. Now you've got to come home. So it's without analysis, without investigation, without insightful thinking, you just create that object of mind to increase your concentration. In other words, our mind is like a monkey. It's been going all over the place. 
sometimes to greediness, sometimes to depression, sometimes to abusive behavior, sometimes to jealousy, sometimes to hatred, sometimes to fear, to disappointment, to envy, to concealment, to fraudulence, to negligence. What else? What, ha- what else can human do? We've been led to do all those. This monkey has been doing all those for years, for many, many life cycles. And now the Buddha said, put the monkey on a leash and bring it back first. That's samatha. If you don't put the monkey on a leash, it always goes out. So you leash it back first. No, there's no insightful thinking, just leash it back. That's samatha. Bring it home first. If you don't come home, how can you be educated? If Sonny is always on the run, he's not coming home to you, your mom. He's not coming back to mom. How can mom educate Sonny? You got to bring Sonny back. Sonny, don't do any, don't do any more roaming. You're not a gypsy anymore. Come home. Come home and listen to mom. Mom has to tell you something that you must listen to. You have to do this, you have to do that. Don't do bad things. So you really have to write a letter to Sonny saying, Sonny, it's time to come home. Don't do any, any more wrong behavior, no more wrong speech, no more wrong thinking, you've got to come home. That's Samatha. And then what happened when Sonny has come home? Then he started to do his homework. He started to have insight. He started to have analysis. He started to have in- investigation. He started to contemplate on impurities of the body, impurities of the mind. What makes our mind impure? What drives us to reincarnations? What is emptiness? What is impermanence? What is the Four Noble Truth, the Eightfold Path? What is the characteristics of dependencies? What is the characteristics of characteristics of so imagination of the mind? All these, you have an investigation and analysis. That's vipassana. All these cannot be done until Sunny has come home and sit down and exercise his insight. So that's the difference. Right now. Some of our candidates in here, they are ready for vipassana. They are ready for vipassana. Maybe for beginners, you're not ready yet. Because your monkey hasn't come home. So some people here who have been here for about eight, nine years, it's time you should do your vipassana. But you, you may not have been successful yet in samatha, but it's good enough for you. Because if you're successful in Samatha, probably you can meditate for five or six hours per day, non-stop, and you feel the repose of mind in you. Equanimity of the mind. If you can meditate for a few hours, and the more and more you meditate, the more and more you feel your mind reposeful. Your mind is in equanimity. Your mind is extremely joyful. That, that kind of joy you cannot obtain by using money to buy it. It's, it's, not, it's not a consumer item. You can't, you can't get it with money. I don't know what you call it. It's that joy in you, that's reposed in you, that equanimity in you that you can't use money to buy it. Money is not everything. That happiness in you, maybe I can say. If you meditate more and more and more, you find that every sitting is increasing your equanimity, repose of mind. You're getting the taste of samatha. If you cannot even meditate for 15 hours per day, how can you practice vipassana? So some of those old monks in the mountains, in the cave, they think they are ascetic practices. They think they are in hardship. They think they are, you think they are poor. You think they are all oh, pitiful. You know, they are in the mountain. I'm watching my TV. I'm going for parties. I'm having this and having that luxuries. And this monk in the mountain is meditating in a cave. You know, that's poor, pitiful. That's terrible. 
But to that monk, he has that equanimity of mind that is so blissful, so happy, so joyful that you don't even know about it.